Dr. Miller, what is evolution? Most biologists would describe evolution as the process of change over time that characterizes the natural history of life on this planet. And what was Darwin's contribution to evolution? Darwin pointed out that there's a struggle for existence, whether we like to admit it or not. He realized that those organisms that had the characteristics that suited them best in that struggle, those were the ones that would hand those characteristics down to the next generation. And that therefore the average characteristics of a population could change in one direction or another, and they could change quite dramatically. And that's the essential idea of natural selection. Starting with Ken Miller, the plaintiffs walked Judge Jones through the conflict at the heart of this case. Miller testified how Darwin's theory pictures the history of life as a tree, with species gradually evolving into others over millions of years, producing new branches and twigs, a process that gives rise to all the variety of life, from bacteria to Darwin's finches to ourselves. But intelligent design takes a different view, as the movement's own literature shows. Intelligent design teaches a history of life in which organisms appear abruptly, are unrelated, and linked only by their designer. What's really being advocated is the idea that organisms poofed into existence uh, through the miraculous act of an intelligent designer, i.e. God, um, that's the view that intelligent design promotes. So how can scientists be so sure Darwin's tree accurately represents the history of life on Earth? As it turned out, the latest in a large body of evidence to refute intelligent design and support evolution was coming to light just as this case was unfolding. I remember thinking to myself when all this was going on, where do they get a load of this? Because it's just so beautiful. Darwin believed that evidence for his idea of common ancestry would be unearthed in the form of transitional fossils. For example, if over millions of years, fish gave rise to land animals, as evolutionary theory predicts, we should find fossils of extinct creatures that are part fish and part land animal. In 1999, paleontologist Neil Shubin and his colleagues set out to find just such a creature. What evolution enables us to do is to make specific predictions about what we should find in the fossil record. The prediction in this case is clear cut. That is, if we go to rocks of the right age and the rocks of the right type, we should find transitions between two great forms of life, between fish and amphibian. Many scientists think life began in the water at least three and a half billion years ago. More recently, about 375 million years ago, the tree of life branched as primitive fish evolved into amphibians, such as today's frogs and salamanders, which live part of their lives on land. Armed with this prediction, Shubin and his colleagues organized an expedition to one of the most desolate places on Earth, the Canadian Arctic about 500 miles from the North Pole, where rocks of just the right age are exposed. Here, they hope to fill a gap in the branch of the evolutionary tree that leads from primitive fish to animals with four limbs, or tetrapods, by finding a fossil of an animal that shared characteristics of both. But after three summers of digging through hundreds of tons of rock in this harsh environment, they had found little of interest. They returned the next year for one last try. Money was running out. This was it. We were told this was our last year up there. And then in 2004, in the third day of the season, a colleague of mine was removing rock and discovered a little snout sticking out the side of the cliff, just like exactly like this. And he removed more rock and more rock and more rock, and it became clear this was a snout of a flat-headed animal. And that's when we knew, flat-headed animal at 375 million years old, this is going to be something interesting. They called it Tiktaalik, which means large freshwater fish in the language of the local Inuit people. 
and it's one of the most vivid transitional fossils ever discovered, showing how land animals evolved from primitive fish. Over here you have a, a fish of about 380 million years old. And when you see just like any good fish, it has uh, scales on its back and fins. You compare that to an amphibian, you find a creature uh, that doesn't have scales, and it's modified the fins to become limbs, uh, arms and legs, and the head's very different. It has a flat head with eyes on top and a neck. What we see when we look at the fossil record, at rocks of just the right age, is a creature like Tiktaalik. Just like a fish, it has scales on its back and fins. You can see the fin webbing here. Yeah, when you look at the head, you see something very different. You see a very amphibian-like thing with a flat head with eyes on top. It gets even better when we take the fin apart. When we look inside the fin, as in this cast here, well, you'll see it as bones that compare to our shoulder, elbow, even parts of wrist, bone for bone. So you have a fish at just the right time in the history of life that has characteristics of amphibians and primitive fish. It's a mix. And just as evolutionary theory predicts, Tiktaalik suggests a tree of life with one species giving rise to another over millions of years. The discovery of Tiktaalik was still being written up at the time of the trial, so it couldn't be used as evidence. But Shubin's colleague, paleontologist Kevin Padian, showed the judge examples of other fossils with transitional features that support Darwin's tree of life. My testimony in the trial was basically taking a day and showing the judge how we do our work and what the evidence is. How dinosaurs evolved into birds as seen in creatures like Archaeopteryx, which has a long tail and teeth like a dinosaur, but feathers just like a modern bird. How ancestors of modern reptiles evolved into creatures now extinct that share a common ancestor with mammals. And how surprisingly, whales evolved from large land animals that returned to the water. And where the pandas book says we can't go from A to B, there, there are no fossils and we don't know how to study them. Actually, we've gone from A to B and to C, D, E, F, and G. We have the fossils, we have the, the, the transitional features, we have the ways of analyzing them with many different lines of evidence, and we're looking for the picture that accounts for the most lines of objective evidence. With each fossil, Padian refuted Panda's claim that different life forms appear suddenly by showing how fossils of extinct organisms bridge the gaps between species, resulting in a picture of gradual evolution just as Darwin proposed. The reporters in the courtroom were just amazed that we knew all this stuff and how come they hadn't learned about this stuff before. And the reason is it's not in textbooks because the creationists fight so hard to keep it out. That's been a big influence. The court took a break and I remember the judge saying something like you know biology class adjourned you know for, for lunch and he was you know smiling and it was clear that we had the judge interested in science I'm a professor of integrated biology lawyers for the parents may have impressed the judge and reporters but many in Dover wondered why is evolution taught as fact if it's just a theory Maybe Darwinism is the prevalent theory out there today, but it is a theory. Uh, it isn't a law of science. It isn't, you know, a fact. It is a theory. We just wanted alternative views uh, talked about, too. We, we weren't saying don't talk about Darwin. Talk about Darwin. It's a, it's a theory. But that's what it is. It's not Darwin's law. It's not Darwin's fact. It's Darwin's theory. To say it's just a theory is really a bit insulting to science because it, it holds, in science, the theory holds more weight than just a fact does. And here I think the term theory needs to be looked at in the way that scientists consider it. A theory is, is not something we think of in the middle of the night after too much coffee and not enough sleep. <laughs> That's an idea. A theory in science means a large body of information that's withstood a lot of testing. It probably consists of a number of different hypotheses and many different lines of evidence. Gravitation is a theory that's unlikely to be falsified, even if we saw something fall up. It might make us wonder, but we try to figure out what was happening rather than immediately just dismiss gravitation. 
facts are just the minutia of science. By themselves, they can be right or wrong. But a theory is something that's been tested and tested over and over again, built on, revised. It continues to be reworked and revised. Dr. Miller, would you agree that Darwin's theory of evolution is not an absolute truth? Well, I certainly would, for the very simple reason that no theory in science, no theory is ever regarded as absolute truth. We don't regard atomic theory as truth. We don't regard the germ theory of disease as truth. We don't regard the theory of friction as truth. We regard all of these theories as well-supported, testable explanations that provide natural explanations for natural phenomena. Should we regard Darwin's theory of evolution as tentative? If we should regard all scientific explanations as being tentative, and that includes the theory of evolution. Science is about discovering the unknown, what we don't know. I don't focus on what we know as a scientist. I want to find new things that tell me about what I don't know. As the plaintiffs testified, that quest to investigate the unknown has led to the discovery of some of the strongest evidence for evolution. Darwin was convinced that species evolve over time through natural selection acting on inherited traits. But he had no idea how those traits arose or how they were passed from generation to generation. When 20th century scientists discovered the role DNA plays in heredity, they founded a new science called genetics that put Darwin's theory to the test.